I've got it on my end. Recording. Oh, it's just oh, recording. recording. Yeah. Great. All right. So um, I'll have my phone. Call me if you need me. But I'm going to just stay on mute and turn my video off. Cool. Thanks, man. Sounds good. Mike, are you hearing a slap back on my voice or are you good? Not now. When Harrison was on, it was like, it oh, was disturbing. Yeah, it's not anymore. Seems like we're good on tech here. Um, yeah, so I mean, really, it's just finding your way. And, and, you know, we've been doing it so long, you know, you, I, and people of our generation that, yeah, it's just getting back to the way things have always been done and trying right. to make them better. You know what I mean? Right. Hand mixing freshly milled, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Whatever your, whatever your stick is, local grains, you know, whatever. Well, I remember, I remember, I think it was like during a board meeting for the, for the guild and you, you made us dinner. We came over and mm -hmm. again, I don't know, 10 or more years ago, but um, mm -hmm. just a handful of us board members and maybe some of your friends. And I remember sitting around and this happens to be a lot in California where the food's so fucking good and everything's so fresh and local. And, and often just like made there, you know, and I remember drinking mm -hmm. maybe like a limoncello that you'd made or something yep. and looking at rye growing next to your backyard and mm -hmm. um, I don't know, wood, wood burning and fresh ground, yo, cooking on, you know, it's just like, dude, like, holy shit, man. I had it, I had an afternoon like that at Della a long time ago too. Mm -hmm. Actually with Nikki Justo and Keith, Keith was, <laughs> Keith was there. Um, yeah, we had him. We had him gagged and stuck in the trunk. But uh, you know, sitting there with Kathleen and Ed and just talking about what they're doing and the sun was setting and I had brought this goat cheese that I had made. I was really proud of and <clears throat> was just like, dude, why are we doing anything but this all the time? Time yeah. dollars. Yeah, it's hard to sell that to people. I mean, I don't. I mean, if I was, I mean, I don't really promote it like whole grain. Like I don't just don't even say that because it kind of trips people. Right. Like just get them something and let them enjoy it. It's delicious. It doesn't have to say that it's whole grain. It doesn't have to say that it's whatever. It's fucking delicious. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because what I'm using and how I'm doing it. Yeah. 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 Some like, people are turned off by about, It's like talking about vegan, right? It's just like, yeah. hey, this is just all, this is just all good, you know, plants and just the way we make it. It's good stuff. What up, Kim? Kim, Mike, Mike, Kim. Kim, Hi, keep thanks our, for doing this. our shit together at the Grain Chain and beyond. We keep her very busy with that job. Doing all the social media fun things. I'll be typing yep. as you talk, Mike. So I'll send you a Google Doc afterward to look at in case you're like, oh, I forgot this or that's wrong. Fix oh. that. And we give that to our members for free as a thank you for their oh. donation like a little transcript that they cool. can get access to i did watch that i did watch that video on uh olander what's his name the yeah, yeah. Todd Olander. so that that the 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 malt for uh the distilling sounds really interesting yeah, yeah the raw is it like sweeter right mm -hmm. the, way he, the yeah. way it was described in that video like that sound do you get any of that stuff for making bread I have before, I, I was making a bread with some of that malt that I was like making a tea out of the malt yep. and taking and actually, you know, grinding up some of the malt super fine. Yep. It's like yep. powder and yep. um, almost like reconstituting a beer uh, within a bread base. And it was freaking rad. It got weird, I, but sticky. Yeah, I have a, I make rye with that. So I, I do a chocolate malted rye with that you oh, know if yeah. it's rye grain or wheat grain that's been malted or barley whatever i have a friend that's a brew supplier uh craft brew supplier and i get like all kinds of crazy malted barley or malted rye or malted wheats like cho really dark chocolate so yeah i just mill them into powder and uh uh put them in the breads and they're fucking delicious yeah is it is it don't get really tacky and and, and wonky no not with the rye right I mean, the rye right right um that's the only ones and i i get stuff from brewers and i have a friend that does an organic brewery so i get spent grain and i i dry it down much like i'm doing with the corn here i dry it down in the sun and then i uh for storage and then i just mill it when i want and then sift it to get off the shaft right yeah it ends up being pretty too pretty toothy with chaff yeah it's good for uh it's good for it's obviously it's like a super flower it's good for cookies it's good for breads you know my buddy was making cakes with it because it's really chocolatey you know so nice. all kinds of stuff so andy i think you're gonna have to be the one that hits record because yeah it's recording now uh harrison had to bail for some farm stuff and I'm then gonna you're hit, gonna I'm gonna be the one broadcast. that opens it up
for yeah, everyone to broadcast in a minute. Yeah. And then you'll be able to add people, right? Say again. Because I think you have to let them. Yeah. So if I hit broadcast in theory, that'll let people in. Mm -hmm. So Hopefully. it is, uh, I'm going to let it in right. I'm going to let it in right now. I'll play a little background banjo. And, and then, wait, um, did you guys talk about doing the acknowledgement about corn? We did. Yep. So here we go. Hitting broadcast. We are live. A little gentle banjo. We are live to the sold out show today. One night only. Sonoma, Sonoma, Sonoma. Robert's coming in. Welcome, Robert. Yeah, so I've been doing it the last three days. I've been working on like, so I have every step of the process. Like I have some getting ready to add the the wood ash. I have some that's drying in the oven. I have some that I'm rinsing here and I have some ground and I have some fresh ground. I have some tortillas made. Awesome. Yeah. Right on. When did you get back from your trip, by the way? Uh, last Monday, last Tuesday, last Monday. Oh. Yeah. I was talking to Guy Finkel in LA and he's like, you should come out. It's going to be a bakery mega summit in LA. I was like, man, if I could, I would fly in for a day, but that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. We just went to the city yesterday and went and uh, yeah, just fucked off for the day. <laughs> is it coming? Is it is San Francisco coming alive again? Uh, it was pretty quiet. It was nice. It's nice getting around. I mean, there's obviously people out and about, but yeah, we had some good food and visited some baker friends and yeah, it was a full day in the city. <laughs> nice. You eat, eat your way through the city. Yeah. Pablo, you got to make, make it down there a fair amount. I'm guessing. No. Not really. I don't really, I don't leave Sonoma that much unless I'm going on a road trip. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm here. I ride a lot. So I ride out here in West County or wherever, but yeah, I don't, no reason to go to the city unless it's a special event or people are coming or want to go eat or something. Well, that was funny when I texted you and, and my friend Dan their day and I said, he might not respond. He's having a baby. Then he's like, I just had the baby. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the, he was in the hospital or whatever. Oh, uh, well, we'll give it a couple minutes here for people to dial in. It is. Oh, yeah, it's 10. Pam, you raised your hand. Do you have a question, Pam? Do you want to post it into the chat? Maybe with a oops. This is our first Tuesday ever, so we don't know how many people will be coming. Yeah. On a Tuesday. It's funny. It still seems like the world is just every day is the same it's like who, who knows what's a good day and a bad day anymore yeah mm -hmm. it's tough is it a free thing that sign up for it to, to do this yep yeah. so this is all yeah. free you that's what one i thought free one once a month yeah cool and all yeah, the initially we had we, we had started out as being a members only and mm -hmm. that's exactly when the pandemic hit and we thought yeah. we didn't want to we wanted to share and so we've just kept up that that same feeling that's cool so i'll give another couple minutes here a little bit of witty witty banjo repartee kevin's wondering what's the linguistic derivation of nixtamal like where did it come from Ooh. which i'm guessing is it's an indigenous you know from indigenous south america the Mayans, as far as I know, uh, the Mayans were the ones that kind of like really, because they were a corn-based diet and they they were dying because of pellagra as a disease and they were they were not getting any nutrition. So they they found the discovery of nixtamalization by wood ash by breaking down the pericarp on the outside and making it more digestible and nutritious. So hence they were able to get nutrients out of the corn and 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 thrive them, to my knowledge. Yeah, and I just did a quick search, and it looks like part of it is also when they were colonized by the Spanish. So when the settlers, uh, colonizers of Spain came through, they renamed by taking words that they saw what the indigenous Mayans were doing. Um, sort of that kind of brings it all in from nextly from ashes and lime and hominy mm -hmm. and tamale from something wrapped. So wrapping it up in ash. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and it's, and it's uh, hominy once you go through that process too. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I make how many grits for, you know, I sell. I sipped it, I grind it, and then I sipped it down to get off the some of the some of the outer shaft, and then uh, I sell those in bags as how many grits, so mm -hmm. which are better than any polenta or anything because it actually tastes like corn. Yeah. All right, guys, we got eleven oh three here, Mountain Standard Time. I'm gonna let it. I'm gonna let it rip. So we're gonna jump in right now. Um, welcome to the Colorado Grain Chain Grain Homeschool. I think we're at number 19 or 20. Kim, is that close? I think uh, so. Right around. It's been a bunch. Nobody really keeps track in the pandemic anyway, but there's been a lot of them. So, um, you know, the Colorado Grain Chain was uh, getting fired up to do our um, uh, road shows and uh, travel around the state and show up at a, uh, a farmer's market or a uh, a fair near you when the pandemic hit and we transitioned over to these grain homeschools, which have been a great joy and a great success at getting out uh, some community and education across not only Colorado, but uh, far and wide across the country and across the world. So we do this in partnership with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union in the Colorado grain chain. Um, we a little some some housekeeping real quick. Um, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A. If you want to make a general comment, you can plug it into the chat. Um, we're recording this video, just so you know. And um, you might ask, what's the best way I can help the Colorado Green Chain? And that's a great question. You can become a member or you could donate and you can go to www.coloradogreenchain.com to find out more. Uh, today's guest is a a good friend and a huge inspiration to me and many others, Mike Zakowski, the baker in Sonoma, California. A. What's up, Mike? Um, we're going to jump into uh, there's, you know, when I called Mike um, a few months ago to, to ask about being a part of a grain homeschool, um, he said, gosh, what should I talk about? And I was thinking of the many, many things that we could we could dig into in this uh, home nixtamalization um, popped up as maybe one of the most exciting things that a lot of people don't know much about and are a little afraid to, to do. So, um, you know, I want to acknowledge the uh, indigenous seed keepers um, in the Central and, and North America where these, uh, where the corn came from, the Mayan people and the uh, Native American people. Uh, and the people who created the nixtamalization process, which not only helped to save uh, their culture, but it's bringing a lot of beauty and flavor to our culture. So uh, Mike Zakowski, welcome aboard. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. Um, so I guess I'll jump right in with, uh, like I said, I have several steps of the process. I'm going to move around with my computer just so we can show you it all. But uh Mike, can I can I actually ask you a question before we yeah. jump into the next the next yep. So, um, you know, I I've um, followed you and been friends and, and a fan for you know maybe twenty years, and um, I think it's pretty wild from the outside looking in at your baking journey. It seems to me that you've kind of you know you started in one place a small bakery uh, in in Texas, right, and then um, kind of traveled out into bigger bakeries in a in a really a uh, big career of making many, many loaves of bread. And, and now you're back, you're a one man band and you're doing everything uh, with amazing terroir, attention to detail, process, um, quality, flavor, life, right? Happiness. Um, yeah, it's more of a, a, a lifestyle than it is about just making bread for me. That's why I choose to do it one day a week because it's a lot of work. <laughs> by yourself so like you're of, like you're, i said it's just a lifestyle choice and and to do that and balance it with other things outside of the work basically and and what is, what is like a week in the life of your baking process look like um i mean i start on monday for my friday process i start doing some prep on monday tuesday i make granola or cookies uh, every other week and then Wednesday really starts like milling and pre-scaling and pre-ferments and then Thursday is uh, making the doughs in the morning because of my process I bulk the doughs after they're mixed and they sit and then I cut and divide later that evening and then bake most everything's baked like that morning of 
after midnight pretty much going to Friday morning market from nine to twelve thirty all year. So yeah, it's it's a quite labor intensive process. It's it's probably there about thirty five to forty hours just for that one market by myself. Wow, so, wow. You know, amazing. And, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're about as happy as you've ever been in your baking career. Yeah, super happy. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. Awesome. Working for yourself and doing what you want. And, you know, I'm thankful I have a community that supports what I do, you know, selling at the market here in town. I've been here in Sonoma for 16 years and I've been at the market for like 12, 11, yeah, 11 or 12 years. So wow. it's been really good. So. And you and you also managed to squeeze in teaching classes kind of all over the world to boot, right? You were in yeah, yeah, yeah. Eastern Europe, I mean, Western Europe last year or two years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it's about traveling and uh, and connecting and meeting others. So that's a way of breaking away from my thing here and still being able to travel by making a little money there while I miss here, you know. So teaching, yeah, whatever I can do. Uh, I teach in Sweden and uh, Germany and. Uh, Poland, Hungary. So yeah, wherever I can go and, and do that, it's fun. And, 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 and with your, you know, kind of depth and breadth of experience and, and years, you know, learning what you do and what you don't want to do. Is there any, any words of guidance you'd give to the greenhorn greenhorns out there who just bought their first tartine book and are, who are super pumped about taking their journey, their first steps? I mean, I say stay small, but you know, I mean, to make a couple loaves at a time, you kind of need to you don't have to, but like, I mean, I got my chops doing production, you know what I mean? Doing a lot of production. And now I know that I don't want to do that. So, I mean, to start out, you know, you know, I call them two loafers. People are making a couple of loaves at a time. It's a lot of the learning curve is much bigger because it takes a lot longer when you're only doing a couple of loaves a week. So I don't know. There's a few of us that are, that, that, that live by my credo, so to speak. Uh, I have a bunch of friends that, that basically just do it by themselves for themselves and it's good. And they're probably the happiest bakers I know. Everybody else is always looking for employees. You mm -hmm. know, it's just the name of the game. You know, you're always, even if you have a full staff, you're always looking for good people, you know, so. Well, I think your impact is is big and, and I appreciate what you've been doing over the years. And every time I've come to visit you, I come away with something meaningful. I don't know if I told you, you know, 10 or more years ago when I was eating your amazing Bialis, wood-fired Bialis, I came home and mm -hmm. started doing Bialis and people love them. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just funny how you pick up influence all over the place if you're, sure. if you're if you're out traveling and paying attention. If you're paying attention, yeah, pay attention to those things that you can pick up. Yeah, I, it's fun to inspire, you know, and that's all I really hope to do is just inspire people to do this sort of thing by themselves, you know, I mean, some people are more business minded and they want to grow something to where they can actually not have to do it as much, but I want to do it. You know, I don't want to have others just do what I want to do. So that's kind of yeah. my choice. So, and it, and it seems like one of the hardest things in life to do is to communicate to others what you're hoping they do. Yeah, for sure. So you don't have to do that. Well, awesome, Mike. Well, let's, let's nixty. Let's nix the lies. So let's see, I have some corn here. Let's see. So I have uh, wood ash, sifted wood ash from my wood fired oven. Um, I just take it and I sift it with a strainer and I'm doing about, uh, well, this is the, what I do is a hundred grams of wood ash per kilo of dried corn. So I have three kilos of corn that I soaked overnight and you don't want to fill a pan too full of, uh, let me do this. Uh, this i'm going to mix a little bit of water with this just to make it a paste and i've got corn that i've soaked overnight so basically i soaked the corn for 24 hours and then i uh, bring it to a simmer the next day and then i make my paste here or sort of a liquidy whatever it doesn't matter i'm just trying to combine it so it mixes in the in the pot on the stove much easier. So now we'll go over to the stove. And it's, uh, you can see the pot's kind of simmering there. Boiling actually. Turn that down. So I basically took a pot of corn that has been soaked for 24 hours, probably only like a third full 
because what happens when this soaks up everything, it expands a lot. So I've got it to the simmer. I've got my paste. Now I'm going to add this to this pot. And I don't know if you can see the corn now. See how the color it's sort of yellowish. You can't really see in there. Let me grab a slotted spoon. But once I add the uh, wood ash, it changes like instantly the color. Let me grab the spoon and I'll try and show this real quick. I was trying to hook this up on my phone so I could show it better, but so you can see the corn. Yep colors like nice and yellow it sort of changes this golden orangish almost once i add this stuff so i'll add this and then i'll put the camera back on there can you see this yeah so you've sifted that the wood ash so it's nice yep. and fine so i just take wood ash out of my wood fire trailer oven and uh then i sift it just so it's you know fine particles and now i'm adding that to this getting it all in there and then what I'm going to do with this is let this simmer for like 30 minutes and then I'll shut this off and let it sit overnight for another 24 hours. You can already see the corn. See the color? Oh, wow. Beautiful. It, it's like this beautiful, brilliant yellow. It actually looks like corn now, like really brilliant instead of pale. So that's that alkalining solution that changes the it right away. Oh yeah. This light might be better this way. So yeah, just gonna simmer this for 30 minutes and then I'll shut it off and let it sit for a whole day. And then from there, I have, I rinse it. So I have, So it's in the wood ash here and I take it out and rinse it in a strainer, run some cold water, get out all the ash. Then you end up with this beautiful stuff where the pericarp is all broken down off the outside. And then you can mill that stuff with a Corona mill which is what that's used for and you end up with tortillas then you can mill that stuff up and make tortillas with it um, you can also nixmalize other things uh, grain rye uh, any wheat grain uh, or I actually nixmalized beets. I went to this dinner and this chef from Mexico had nixmalized some beets. So there's many things you can do with it. It's for texture. So they use, it's like a lye is used for like, uh, it's calcium hydroxide as well. And they use it for like, it's like a pickling, pickling uh, thing as well. So it keeps pickles crispy. It changes that solution so it's not so acidic, I guess. Um, but yeah, and then I have also taken the, uh, the stuff that I did three days ago and I dried it here in the sun. Let me see this. And then I milled it into what I would call hominy grits. Because once you go through the process of nixmalizing, it turns into hominy. And then I mill it into uh, what I call grits. And then I can sell it like this, or I can uh, cook this like grits and make uh, bread with it, add it to my bread. So there's many, many ways to use and manipulate this stuff. So I'm just kind of cleaning this stuff here. You can see I'm just getting the water to run clear. 
Mike, and you said 100 grams of wood ash to one kilo of dry corn? Yes. Yep. And this corn I'm using today is just uh, California, organic California yellow corn, but I also have some purple corn here. I got from Guy actually uh, last week. I have Oaxacan green dent. There's many, I mean, any corn you can use. Um, I think there's some corns that are better for tortillas. Um, but the nixmalization process also makes it a really strong binding agent and increases the flavor like tenfold in my opinion. It actually tastes like corn. Because most of the time, I mean, corn doesn't really have much flavor or, or nutrition, obviously. For me. That's why we need to do the nixmalization process. I remember being at, at grain school a few years ago and, and meeting a, a Hopi farmer who did a presentation on, on, <clears throat> on farming in the four corners of Colorado here. And, uh -huh. um, and it, it, it totally transformed my view of corn from just being a kind of boring, you know, white, white fields in Iowa that you drive through for seemingly years of your life uh, to get through it um, to a beautiful multicolored aromatic, flavorful, nutritious food group. And, and in the past few years, I've just been so inspired to find ways to incorporate it into my, my baking, which is often wheat-based wheat primarily, right? Mostly wheat flour or, or whole grain. Yeah, I grew up in the Midwest, so corn is everywhere and it's not very good stuff either. But so there's the rinse stuff now, you can see. And then I just let that... Uh, uh, I usually take it out in the sun and let it dry out in the sun. Um, I let it dry out in the sun all day yesterday while I went to the city. And then I'm finishing it up in the uh, oven at like 140, just so I'm not like toasting it necessarily. I mean, which you can as well add a little toasted flavor by, um, you know, doing a little bit hotter. Slow and low is good though. So, and my oven only goes down to 140. So I'm just drying it in the oven now, which I can show you that as well. So this is uh, simmering as well here. Turn it down a little bit. The color, beautiful. You could also use calcium hydroxide or cal as you can, as it's called, and you can find that in, in uh, like Mexican markets and stuff. Anybody who's making uh, corn tortillas is definitely doing this. So you know, you're make. You're going to simmer for an hour, you said, Mike? 30 minutes. 30 minute simmer and then overnight rest? Yep. And there's dried corn there that I'm uh, drying in the oven at 140 Fahrenheit. Yeah, so that'll simmer 30 minutes. Shut it off and just let it sit in that liquid. And make sure the one thing you want to do is not overfill your pot. This is a pretty good sized pot. And I put three kilos, it's kind of pushing it because what happens is as it sits overnight, it absorbs all that liquid and it'll fill up to the top. And you want to keep this thing full when you're done, even add more cold water just so this thing is full so that uh, it's easier to rinse off the next day. If not, it could get really bound in the uh, corn, the, the wood ash. And, and that's what I found in my experience. So it's, it's best to, uh, Keep that thing full because it will absorb a lot of liquid. So, um, what else? I mean, I, I ground this stuff on my uh, mock mill over here. So, yeah. You can also do, like I said, I have the, uh, I could grind some fresh stuff here. Take this fresh stuff that I just uh, rinsed here, and we can grind it here and make. The only part I'm not sure on this how to really get rid of is the. So the pericarpia is, is here. I did make tortillas this way, although it's a bit, um, 
I don't know what you want to say. It's got some of the skins on there still, which is tough, even though it's been broken down. So the pericarp is to corn what the bran is to. Uh, exactly. Yep. And like any grain or legume or seed or nut, for us to really get nutrition out of it, it should be mixableized for corn. It should be sprouted for grains or legumes or seeds or fermented. So it's really the only methods and every, every one of those things needs to be done that way so we can get the nutrition. If not, we're not really getting the proper nutrition from those things. So here's the ground up fresh corn. Then I can make a little ball and we can make some tortillas, which I made earlier. So that, that's masa at this point. Basically, but it does have the, I don't know if you can see, it has the, the has all the, the stuff on there, the seeds and stuff. I did one here with just, uh, this is just the ground corn that I added water to, but I need to grind it finer, finer, sorry, so that it's more like, uh, it's a little fragile at that point. I need to mill it a little bit finer in the mill to make it uh, more like a masa. But I can put this in here. Voila. Mm -hmm. Corn tortilla. It's thinner, as thick as you want. And that's what these are. I just made these a while ago. But you can see it's got the it's got the corn exterior in there. So it, it can be a little uh, I don't know. They're super flexible and they're good, but you know, again, it's I'm not hundred percent sure on on that process, how to really remove the, uh, I don't know if you can see all the. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and venture a guess that that's good for digestive health. I mean, it's been broken down, so it should be fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just a texture, I guess, for some people, they may kind of trip on it. So no, no salt in a traditional tortilla. Say again? No salt in a traditional tortilla. Uh, I'm not 100% on that either. I didn't add any salt to this. I just do the corn. Yeah, I you can certainly it. season it on top or whatever, you know. Put it on my little uh, my little crepe pan. This stuff's cooking away. Yeah, the corn, the color is just amazing. And it's already starting to break it down. I think the, the lack of salt in a tortilla is, is a is a health advantage to the whole, you know, your whole kind of diet uh, ha habit because you're going to have probably a salty, you know, barbacoa or chicken or right. vegetables on there. And Something well seasoned for sure. Right. It's, uh, you know, I've talked for years with, with, with different folks about, you know, looking at hamburger buns and hot dog buns and do you really need 250 milligrams of sodium in a hamburger bun when you're going to have you know, all this other salty meat on there and, and et cetera, it seems a bit excessive for a country that's, you know, kind of hurting from a nutritional standpoint. For sure. Yeah. Just add the proper quantity to make the bread work for you. And then, yeah, they can uh, season their burger. They can season their, whatever they're adding to that bun. So uh, when I do grind it for um, the, uh, the grits, I have these uh, sieves that I had made for me. And this is kind of like my grit one where I can sift off. I don't know if you can see all this stuff here. This is some of the coarser stuff that I don't necessarily want in my grits. Show you that. It's kind of coarser, you know, and this sieve is a nice, uh, I can't remember what the number is off right, right off hand, but I had these little wood sieves made for me to do this kind of stuff. You can buy the screens online and so, so, th so that's helpful if you are, so these are some cute um, questions coming in here. Um, looks like that sieve is helpful if you're drying the corn and you can shake off the uh, bran in that, in that sense. If you're trying to remove the pericarp in a wet process, would you just float it to the top of the water and try to scoop it off? No, because it doesn't break off that easy. As you can see, I'll show you in this pot here. So you can see this has still wood ash in it. And it doesn't really, 
it's kind of all still part of it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to really remove that whole thing. So yeah, it's still kind of part of the corn. So I'm not 100% sure on that myself, honestly. I, I know what, one of our Mexican chefs, when she's doing family meal at Moxie, and we do tortillas and she'll go pick it bit by bit and she'll boil it until it really pops enough to um, to blow oh. up the pericarp. And then she, oh, wow. yeah, she spends half an hour picking it, you know? Yeah, well, there you go. Then that, that would be the solution. <laughs> I'm not picking it. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I just make the tortillas. I'm pretty rustic like that. So to me, it's, you know, like I said, the flavor is fine for me. It's just, uh, you know, it can be a little toothy maybe. And it's just got all that texture in there. You know, and, and but, your, your, your grain mill, that's the uh, Corona, the classic kind of stone. Hand yeah, hand. yeah. Super classic. You know, that's what they were used for. Yeah. Um, I used one in uh, Costa Rica and we did like fresh corn, not nixmalized. We did fresh corn through one of those and made amazing like corn uh, pancakes basically i don't even think we added anything to it i think we just ground the corn through the corona uh mixer here and just uh i don't know if we binded it with any i can't remember it was so long ago but yeah we just made like corn pancakes it was delicious but and if you crank it down tight enough you can get it you can get it relatively fine on that oh yeah for sure yeah definitely i mean it just kind of pushes it through so so have you have you noticed any flavor difference between using cow and wood ash? I have never used cow because I have wood ash. So and your tortillas taste really good. Yeah, I mean it tastes like corn to me. You know, it's like that's kind of you know when I sell the the how many grits. You know, I mean I, I promote it as that. It's like it's you know to me polenta is kind of blah. It doesn't really have a lot of corn flavor because it hasn't gone through the mixmalization process. So. Um, that process alone just intensifies the corn flavor and makes it more uh, bindable, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, without that process, it's not, you can't really make the tortillas because it's not that strong of a, a, of a binding. Um, yeah, it kind of becomes more like a, not a putty, but you know, you can, it's pl pliable and you can roll pliable. it. Just exactly. To, yeah. And do you, do you know what, I know that there's a, quite a bit of bio bioavailability that happens um, to some minerals and nutrients. Do you remember, is it B, B vitamins that become uh, accessible when you, when you nixtamalized? Good question. Uh, is it D? I don't know. Maybe Kim, maybe Kim will uh, do a little quick on, on the spot research for us. I'll look it up. I'm not 100 sure. We we have we have a we have a guy here in Boulder who um, takes some uh, Chihuahua blue corn and uh, makes it into tortillas at a local tortilleria, and we buy them. And what what blows me away is when I take one of his tortillas, or organic tortilla, and I put it on a hot skillet in my kitchen, yep. and the, with a little bit of oil, and my kitchen is filled with that indescribable you know corn corn aroma 100%. i think we should make a perfume out of it because you smell that and you just come running it's delicious yeah so it reduces the phytic acid since phytic acid blocks your absorption of zinc calcium and other important minerals it's important for this process to take place so that's what the nixmalization does it, it allows the um the phytic acid to be broken down and uh interesting same and thing as same thing as sourdough fermentation pretty much yeah yeah Wow. The phytic acid is the, you know, is the, is the enemy, so to speak, that you need to break down to make it digestible. Interesting. Yeah, it was invented by the ancient Mesoamericans 3,500 years ago. Originally, wood ash was used in place of cal. Yeah, so. So I've got a great question here from um, Gabri Gabriel. What's up, Gabriel? Um, Hi, Mike, can you share some ideas of how you like to incorporate the nixtamalized corn or porridge into bread dough? Yeah, so I just take these grits that I ground down to this particular uh, granular, and then I um, would cook that like a, you know, like a polenta, so like a grit, you know, uh, four to one, five to one, whatever your whatever your preference is and, and watching it on the stove and uh, cooking it slow and um, 
then incorporating, letting it cool and incorporating it into bread. So I would do it a 12 hour in advance kind of thing, let it cool down overnight. Or if it's hot, I would even put it in the fridge overnight. Um, just depends on your, your dough method. Um, and then, yeah, put that in the bread as a, as a, as a grit. And that would be, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40% what you're, what you want to do or more. Um, you can roll it in corn flour, then grind some of this even finer and use that on the outside for more flavor. You can, I also put some of this, uh, ground finer as a flour, as opposed to just like the grit granular and add that as well. So lots of different ways to add it to your, um, to your bread for sure. You, you ever, you ever tried doing a, a sort of swirl, uh, a swirl in la layering it on like a cinnamon, cinnamon roll? I haven't. That would be a good idea too. We, we, we took guy, guy from Sior did that recently and yep. we, we gave it a shot with some really nice, uh, organic blue corn <clears throat> and during our pre-shape we flattened out our dough piece to kind yeah. of a long, skinny focaccia type thing yep slathered it, slathered it on as if it were a cinnamon schmear yep. and then jelly rolled it up and uh it was Sounds amazing. It, it was tricky to do without getting really messy yep. but uh man does it look beautiful and obviously tastes great but a real looker when you slice it yeah it sounds like a great idea honestly um you could do it. You could probably even do it with a laminated dough, you know, like make your grits, your polenta style, whatever, and then let it cool down and then just spread it on. Cause it's pretty, uh, it's got a nice, uh, texture to it. You know what I mean? And it's probably spreadable at that point. So, and it would probably be great like on a Danish or a croissant type thing. Like you said, a cinnamon roll kind of thing. You could do a total, uh, Mexican style thing with like that with like whatever fresh cracked corn on top or, you know, like I said, milled flour or something, whatever, to get, add a little bit of texture on the outside as well. Yeah. I, th I think, um, you know, I've had a, I've had a, 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 re a whole re new approach to um, making bread beautiful uh, and, 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 and a visually appealing that I personally didn't have 10 or 20 years ago. I thought it was all a little foo-foo um, mm -hmm. to, to spend that much time, uh, on the visual aspect of bread compared to the nutrient and the flavor and the, mm -hmm. you know, the sustenance component of yep. it. But, uh, what, watching uh, some of what guys doing out at, at Sea Or Bread in Los Angeles, yep. uh, and a lot of other people, um, you know, when I look at your bread, it, it is just stunning, you know, visual patterns of flour. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, where art meets beauty and science in, in your world? For sure. Um, we eat with our eyes, right? So like the first thing when you see bread, like you, and people do that too. They're like, can I have that one? You know what I mean? They, now I wrap all my breads, but typically when I didn't, they, you know, they see stuff, you know, it's like they come into your store too and they see it on the shelf and they're like, can I have that one? Cause people see and eat with their eyes. They want it. They wanted that particular loaf cause it appeals to them. So, you know, beauty is, uh, is part of it, I think, and making the aesthetics and making it look good. It should taste good, hopefully, if it looks good. <laughs> but um, that's uh, that's definitely part of it. Um, and for me, it, it stemmed out of like competition stuff uh, is where I kind of found my groove with that, like going back like 15 years ago, at least 15, actually longer, like 17 years ago, first trying out for a team. Team USA, so yeah, I just for the, uh, for the coupe for the coupe de Mans, the World Cup of bread in, in in Paris, France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I think I first saw the the I just missed the ninety nine team, but I saw the O two team uh, preparing for the competition. So that's kind of my first involvement, and then I tried out for three teams after that, and finally made the team. And yeah, so it's just that drive to make things look really spectacular as well as taste good um yeah for people to like i said people go in and they you know they want to buy stuff that looks beautiful so and so what was that like going to the coupe de Mon and working as a team you know i guess you you were doing the bread right so you're one yep. of, of the three but pretty, pretty pretty intense what was that like as an experience being in europe and using different flowers and different equipment so fun yeah, it's just an amazing uh, opportunity to do it. Um, so yeah, and travel and 
you know, what we say is a good baker will be able to go anywhere and make bread. So, you know, we traveled a lot in the States to practice, uh, to get, um, to be able to move about and, and get, you know, cause you take, get taken out of your comfort zone, taken out of your own shop and going to practice in a new shop with all new stuff, trying to find stuff, ovens, mixers, everything's different. So traveling around and practicing a lot in the States prior to going to Europe and the flour is different even from coast to coast with the same, you know, if you're using like a, a big producer of flour, uh, as opposed to a local thing, which most of this stuff is, it's driven by, you know, bigger companies, you know, it's going to be different coast to coast. So, you know, that first day is always a challenge when you go to a new location and then hopefully you pick it up pretty quick and, and are able to adapt, whether it's hydration or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, the French flowers are totally different. We practiced in France for a week prior to the competition. Um, not, just using French flowers, but not necessarily using the ones that are going to be in the competition. Again, they're all different. So just getting used to their, their flowers, which are totally different than what we have here. Obviously the milling, everything about it, the growing different varieties. So yeah. It, well, it, it, and not, not only were you using different flowers, I remember some of your formulas had, what was the apple bread? It had um, cider cider. Yeah. So I, I, collaborated with a winemaker here in Sonoma and we made apple cider. We made the first years, we made a cedra style, which is a Spanish style, which is still, and it was a, a bit on the sour side. And I incorpor I did many methods. I used it in the Poolish and the Levan as a liquid. Um, I think the latest incarnation I did is I would make oats and I would cook oats like a porridge and I used the cider as the liquid. Wow. To intensify that flavor and also cook off the alcohol. Wow. So many different ways to do it. Yeah, it's tough to come up with new ideas and be creative for a competition because so many things have been done. For but, sure, uh, for sure. I mean, that's the you know in interesting thing. I, I remember working in the grocery world and every month being asked, okay, what's our what are our new flavors for January? And you're like, oh man. I've been giving you new flavors every every month for 15 years. Like I'm I'm out of new flavors. You know, it's kind of hard to continue to innovate. But the beauty that I'm seeing is that, you know, I guess it's what Poilan calls retro innovation. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you, a lot of times you just go back in time, right? For sure, I go so, back to the old breads, and then I just you know whatever has changed that year, whether it's, you know, I do a tomato bread or I do a roasted sweet corn with like. You know, one year I got beautiful, beautiful um, cilantro uh, seedlings or like the, when it starts seeding, so you get the coriander seeds, but like they're still really young and tender. A little the, sprout the, shoot, shoot. Yeah, the flavor inside the bread is just insane. You bite into it and you're like, wow, what is that? And it's just like, it's like really immature seedlings that are forming at the top of the cilantro as it seeds. Wow, wow. So yeah, just, I mean every year is a different year in, in growing. So, you know, I may take the same bread, but I'll do it a different way maybe. Yeah. And change uh, it up a little bit. And, and I was looking at your, at your um, website and I went to your uh, online ordering platform and, and got mm -hmm. to see a little bit of your current menu, but um, it's, it's classic because most of the people I know who are doing the best work out there, it's really hard to find info and their menus and, you know, you kind of got to know them or you got to live near them. Um, for all the folks out there that want to know more about the breads you've done in the past and what's available now, um, where could they find that info? I mean, really my website's about it. Um, I don't, and that's, you know, within the last like five to seven years, I put stuff up there. Like, I mean, those breads have changed. Some of those are still ongoing, but have changed to a different shape or something, you know, for me, I just do the farmer's market. So my breads are put in these boxes that I've uh, made a long time ago, like 11 years ago. So I don't really do any rounds per se breads because rounds don't really work well in the boxes and they don't really stand up very well at the market. So I tend to do ma mainly batards. So for me, it's, it's all about aesthetics and what works at the market and how many breads I can put in those boxes. So it's not necessarily about like uh, what's best for the bread crumb wise. It's what works for me for the market. You know, I'm going for flavor, but 
I'm not super worried about the crumb because it's it's all about like it's like even the cut you know if you're doing a single cut you're going to get the best open crumb I don't do any single cuts because that that ear when you put them in a box they don't stack up very well and you smash that anyways you know what I mean mm -hmm. so if you look at my breads when I post photos about like the market breads there none of them have that singular thing to where they're like when they're stacked up side to side, you know, they don't smash that ear, so to speak. So I'm not really trying to go for that. I'm just going for more aesthetics. That's simple that I can get the most in the boxes and, uh, and great flavor. So, so, I mean, so that's kind of funny. So I think, you know, we, we live in this world that you and I have, have grown th up, I guess, not with, but through maybe yep. where, yep. you know, at one point it was about flavor another point it was about just cranking out bread and getting bread to the masses and making thousands of loaves and then now it's back to being about flavor and community and nutrition in that arc instagram came onto the scene and instagram showed us open pore structure from amazing bakers throughout the world yep. and that's been a bit of a rabbit hole plenty to hear you say that you know you're you're not always thinking about that and that the tight crumb structure may or may not be a problem. I could care less. I mean, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, that's what you're always trying to achieve. But like I said, the, the singular score is is the most ideal to get that. And that's what everybody does, that little rabbit cut, you know what I mean? It looks like a little rabbit when you're done from the side, it just, right? It just lets the dough breathe. It just lets the, the bread. Well, breathe. what happens is all that energy is forced into one spot in the cut. So you get all those irregular holes and they burst and they can become bigger because they're all driving towards that one cut. Whereas on my loaves, if you see like my Campania loaf, I have, it's like a, yeah, I don't have any, I sold out last week, but I have like a, a leaf cut or whatever, you know what I mean? And it, that doesn't allow all that energy to go one way and really force it way to get those bigger irregular holes. Like I said, mine is more for aesthetics to, make sense for the market because that right. ear would be gone anyways if i stacked them back to back it would just smash it right because i'm trying to maximize the amount of breads i can put it in my boxes are full as it is so you know i'm doing like 350 to 450 to 500 total pieces and and a piece is a cookie to a pretzel to a baguette so it's you know it's not all just big loaves or whatever i do kilo half kilo some mixed bread, some freshly milled. 60% uh, of the grain I use is freshly milled uh, that I mill myself. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to anything. I've done it, done all that stuff, whether it's yeast or natural leaven. Currently, everything I do is natural leaven and it has been for some time. Um, I just don't really need to buy yeast. You know what I mean? I can manipulate my sour to get it sweet. I make 100% uh, pan to me. Uh, which is a traditional French bread, French bread, but with 100% freshly milled spelt. And by way of process, I can make that sweeter with my with my natural leaven. Um, so with, yeah, with, I mean, with a young, a young Levan? is that? The yeah, um, I use a stiff that I actually wrap it. So I, I make a pat fermente, and I wrap it uh, overnight, so it keeps the pH higher, around like four three to four five. Um, so it's going to come off sweeter. So yeah. like an anaerobic sort of panettone mother wrap? Sort of, but just with a stiff starter. I don't go through like a two or three step day process to make that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have that kind of, I don't want to put that kind of time into something like that. So I literally just to make a 50% hydration pat fermenté with spelt, uh, a bit of sour, like a 1% seeding and some salt. And mm -hmm. then I wrap that overnight and it balloons up but it's holding that pH at a higher level. So it won't get too sour for me because that bread, I want to be sweet. So cool. Yeah. And so. what, um, did you learn any cool tricks hanging out with all the, all the old school bakers in, in, uh, Eastern Europe when you were there recently or a couple of years ago, I guess. Um, I mean, I always pick up something. I can't remember what I, I mean, going to Germany is really cool. There's a lot of, I mean, all that stuff. There's so much history. Uh, my friend Arn, he's in, uh, Outside of Nuremberg, he's, his bakery is 333 years old. I mean, yeah, just hanging out with people like that, like the knowledge is insane. Like the stuff they do with rye and 
I mean, super cool, just amazing technique. And I mean, he makes this rye that you put in these wood molds that go in the oven and the, the bread spreads to this mold that goes in the oven. It's just insane. Like, you know, and their education is way more advanced than, than we have had here in the States for sure. I mean, my friend Pablo, he went through the master's program. So they have that there for bakers as opposed to, you know, here in the States, it, it was never much. And it's obviously becoming a lot more now. And like everybody's teaching now, everybody's trying to share their knowledge, what, whatever they've learned over the, over the years of their baking experiences. So not necessarily certified teachers, but like there it's, it's a little bit more rigorous, I think. And there's knowledge behind it. And, uh, documentation behind what they do i think so it's like it's like certified yoga instructors are over here there but they're certified bread instructors over there yeah i mean it's just i mean it's getting obviously it's getting better here culinary schools have more bread programs when i went to culinary school there was no bread program so now there's like bread programs there's specific schools that are teaching just breads uh like san francisco baking institute um that's the only one i know that comes to mind right offhand but uh yeah, so it's just different, you know, and well, there it's... When you think of SFBI, San Francisco Baking Institute, and you could draw a little, you know, kind of a organizational chart of, of the influence that Michelle has had over the us bakers in America, it's kind of oh. tremendous, right? Because none, oh, yeah. none of us knew where to buy equipment or right. where to get these secrets that we'd only read about. And, yep. um, you know, uh, the Justos are doing a great job up at, uh, not Central Milling, but... Uh, Keith Justo Bakery Supply, yeah. Justo Bakery Supply, and CIA, and Johnson Wales. Everybody's putting in a bunch of work, but I think uh, Michelle's been sort of carrying the torch, you know, long and high for so long. Being French and having that connection obviously helped, you know what I mean? Bring some of that knowledge over, for sure. You know, it's like, I'm a, I'm a huge cycling fan, and like, you know, the only way to get, like, you got to go over to Europe and, and ride with them, you know what I mean? Like, that's, if you want to be a successful, like, pro cyclist, you know, it's like going over to Europe and most of them, I say, you know, at that level, if you want to win the, win the big races. So it's like, it's like bread. I mean, getting that knowledge from people that have been doing it forever. You know, it's part of their culture, you know, bread, cycling, all that stuff. It's, it wasn't so much a part of our culture. Our bread is wonder bread, right? That's our, that's our bread. So <laughs> that's our, did, our bread, our bread culture, white, white bread. Wonder yeah. Bread. I mean, yeast did pan bread. I mean, that's what our culture is. It, it, it always has been. So, well, I know I know that you and I and and, and many bakers who've been uh, lucky lucky enough to be, you know, under the umbrella of uh, Michelle Suess and a lot of these other great folks have take a lot of pride in, in sharing that knowledge. And you know, I know uh, you know you let just about anybody in to to pick up pick your brain or, or come to a class and absolutely we certainly do as much as we can and i think it's that collaborative um uh you know feeling of wanting to to share knowledge that's such a i don't know makes baking feel so good right it's like yeah here i'll take you know i'll give you the recipe man you gotta you gotta take it from there but here's here's how i do it a formula is a formula i mean that's doesn't mean anything to me you know what i mean like it's it is what it is you, you how you do it is how you do it. It's going to be way different than how I do it. Right. Even if you replicate it, your flour is different. Your shop's different. Everything, your starter is different. You know, a formula is just a base. It's not a, it's, it's a guideline to, to do something. Um, take it and, and make it your own. Yeah. And I, I have people visit from all over. I, my give back now because of my knowledge and, and doing the competition and all that stuff is to teach and just to share my knowledge now and pass it on to the to whoever you know whether it's an older generation or a younger generation whatever it is people changing careers people you know yeah I mean we don't have that culture of bread where like you know like in Europe where you kind of grow into it either with a baking family or you start at a very early age you know, it was kind of looked down upon really like bread baking. It was kind of the lower, the low of, of cooking. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, you're working in the middle of the night. No, you don't get any recognition. And Rebation. that's kind of, what, that was kind of the whole spawn of the competition anyways, is to bring acknowledgement to the bakers that are, you know, putting in the work to bring something, you know, uh, nutritious to uh, a, a dining room table or whatever, you know, a vehicle to make a sandwich or whatever it is. 
Well, and look at us now. It took a pandemic to make us popular, but sourdough is on top, baby. And yeah. everybody, you know, it's, it's, you know, another thing I always think is funny is when we started baking a long time ago, you know, you're working crazy hours and you're working your butt off and, and you're concerned about meeting schedules and delivery deadlines and so forth. And here we are 20, 30 years later, and now we're having to be teachers on Zoom calls and teachers in classes. And that's a funny arc too, because I can tell you, for one, I never thought I'd be up at a podium, you know, with a laser pointer, <laughs> let alone on a Zoom call, having to having to right. MC, you know, a um, forum. But it's a really interesting growth step, and it, and it and it's uh, it's a fun one. It's fun. You have to adapt, you know. Yeah. With anything, you have to adapt or die. You know what I mean? And and the places and people that adapted during the pandemic were able to thrive, and others that didn't have died. Yep. yep. <laughs> Plain and simple. I mean. Some people just, yeah, we had a really good meal last night in this, in the city at this Italian place. And I mean, they're like, you know, thankfully the PPE or whatever it is, PP, whatever that the loans came through and it, and it, it really worked for people because if without it, they would have been dead. Yeah. So yeah. Adapt or die. I got a couple more questions just came in here. One is um, from Sam from arts. Uh, is it room temp or in refrigerator that you're doing your Pat Fermente? Uh, room temp. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my room's probably like, yeah, 65, 68, whatever, in where I put that, Pat Fermente. Okay. So, and how many hours was it again? It's like a 12-hour 12, 12 to 14-hour process. Okay. And you're wrapping in what, Kush maybe? I actually wrap it in saran wrap first so it doesn't dry out, and then I put the Kush over it and tie it up then. Okay. And it we still kind of blows out sometimes. I mean, it's pretty strong. So... We we, we made a madre once, uh, Maurizio and I at Udi's, you know, we were uh -huh. making Penatone one season a couple of years ago, and we had the little little baby bundle of Kush wrapped on a, on a workbench, and we came to work the next morning, and everybody's like, God, what was that explosion last night? The, clean, the cleaners were like freaked out, and we watched the video uh, of the- Blowing up. Before. The cleaner was walking around, it was like three in the morning. We had to do it in slow-mo, but the- little sourdough baby bust a hole in the couche yep. shot a million pounds of thrust through this teeny hole started to spiral shot sourdough all over the walls of the bakery the dude dropped to the floor he thought it was like a an attack like a gunman and it was it was the madre. yeah my couche, so last week my couche actually has a hole in it and it busted through the plastic and it was coming out and it was just like on top of the thing when i came in in the morning and it's just like there's like a pile of like <laughs> stuff out dried out on top. So mm -hmm. I just put that in the water first so it hydrates and just let it sit in the water for a minute. Yeah. Whatever. So I also, in that dough, which I discovered recently, I actually put in some fresh seed. So my, my normal uh, stiff starter, I feed this on a 12 hour cycle too, uh, when I use it for whatever, for feedings and stuff. And I actually put in like 10% of that in the morning, Wow! which helps. So it gives it a boost instead of just using all that Pat Fermente that's kind of somewhat exhausted itself. Right. Um, but yeah, so it, it's something I discovered recently because yeah, I, I love learning and learning is, is by making mistakes. So, you know, that's the hugest lesson for me. It's like, I learn all the time by making mistakes. And, you know, even me baking by myself, I make mistakes all the time. <laughs> well, there's so much to learn. And, it, it, it you know, this and, level of baking reminds and, me of like jazz or, or, or uh, wine. It's like you think you know a little bit about wine and then you're just like, whoa, wait, what? Yeah. You know, it's just a life. It's a lifelong journey. Um, well, if I can, can we recap the um, the next year process real quick? Yep. so Everyone's got it. We start with 100 grams of ash. Yep. And one kilo of dry corn. Yep. Simmer for yep. 30 minutes. Yep. Pull that, let it sit in its own juices overnight with plenty of room to expand. Yep. Um, rinse the next day. Yep. And then grind or dry. So grind, I, I dry it just because I'm not making big batches and I'll, that's my preservation then I can mill it at any time. I'll keep it in that form dried and then I'll uh, mill it when I want to use it for the bread. 
and make so you keep the whole the whole nixtamalized kernel dried yep. and then when you're ready for it then you grind it so it stays fresh yeah yeah because once you once you mill it it's kind of you know it oxidizes and the flavor starts going down it could go rancid too you're right so keep it in its whole form like this dried and then mill it uh mill it into this when you're ready to use it and make your your grits or whatever so awesome well cool we're creeping into the noon hour here in colorado and um man what a what a fun session mm -hmm. super cool to be able to hang out and see your face and chat for a little bit it's been a long time yep um thanks for taking the time yeah appreciate you having me on good good times cool man well i look forward to seeing you uh sometime soon i'd love to come do a session in the too and eat our way through all the good stuff going on out there for sure anytime all right, Mike. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. All right, man. Take care. Peace. Take care. Bye.